book of Romans, just by way of introduction, I cannot think of a, of a more important book in the Bible. It's all God's word, I know, but for me, this is a, a critical book. Uh, is it easy to understand? No. Uh, is it, uh, is it, are you able to understand it? Yes, you are able to understand it. Uh, are you able to understand it by reading it, bang, just like that? No, probably not. I can't. We need God's spirit. We've got to agonise and be aware that by struggling with each, each of these chapters, you will learn, just as I have learned as well. So I encourage every person here to make this book a, a very important book in your in your your Bible readings. It is Paul is explaining the gospel in these early chapters, and he explains the gospel in two parts primarily. There's probably more, but these are the ones the simple me that comes out clearly. He gives us the bad news, and then he gives us the good news. And the good news is so wonderful because the bad news is so condemning. So just very very quickly, the first two chapters of the book of Romans that we've already covered gives us the bad news. And the bad news is summarised halfway through uh, chapter 3 when Paul makes it very clear that all have sinned. All have sinned. There is none righteous, no, not one. There is not even the fear of God in them. No one seeks after God, he says. These are very clear statements that we are not seeking God. And yet the wonderful part of the last part of chapter 3 is that indeed when you read between the lines, God came seeking you and came seeking me, sinners as we are. It's a wonderful book and it explains the gospel. Can I tell you this? It is so important that to understand the gospel, do not listen to what I say. Do not listen to what Bobby says or what Joe says. Listen only to the word of God. And here we have in the book of Romans, the word of God, it explains the gospel very clearly. Um, in chapter 3, Paul concludes this way. He says, to summarise what he said, he says, a man is justified by faith apart from observing the law. He's really saying, because the word justified is a word we don't, doesn't come easily to my mind all the time, and I'm sure it's the same with you. What does that mean? It means to be declared righteous by God. That's what it means. So if you want to be declared righteous, and that's the only way you can enter into the presence of a holy God, it's the only way to go to heaven, to put it, bottom, put it bluntly. You, it is only by faith, and it's apart from observing the law. It's, it's, from, it's apart from keeping, do, carrying out all of God's requirements, all of his commandments. It's only by faith. We'll, we'll speak about that, and I'm going to be a fair bit of repetition through these verses, because that's how Paul is teaching through all these passages here, he repeats and he repeats and he repeats. I wonder why he repeats. I don't know, but I can guess because it's so important that we understand the things that he's repeating. In the first 12 verses, I'm not going to cover them but because I covered them about 18 months ago, but let me just say this. These first 12 months, of these first 12 verses, I should say, of chapter 4 now, Paul states that Abraham was justified, again meaning to be declared righteous or right before God. I'll read that again. Paul states that Abraham was justified by God on the basis of his faith and not his works. Similar um, point, similar message, similar teaching is found in Paul's letter to the Philippians chapter 3 and verse 9. This is what it says, And be found in him, not having a righteousness of my own, that comes from the law, that is, from my own obedience. But that which comes through faith in Christ, the righteousness from God, from God, that depends on faith. Romans 3 verse 9. In this, in those first 12 verses, Paul also makes the very important um, observation, which is important for us. Because the Jew, the Jewish person, they thought Abraham was righteous because of his righteous deed of, of circumcision. He was the first one who was ever circumcised, along with his son Ishmael and the other members of his family. And from then on, God made a requirement. Well before the law was given, made a requirement every Jewish boy had to be circumcised on the eighth day of his, after his birth. And they thought he was, he was righteous because of this righteous act of circumcision. 
Paul says, uh uh, that's not, that's not the case at all. Because in fact, 14 years before Abraham was circumcised, God declared him to be righteous. 14 years beforehand. So therefore, his circumcision had zero to do, absolutely nothing to do with him being declared righteous or justified in God's, God's sight. Let's read verses uh, 13 to 15, and if uh, Noel will bring, bring that up for me, that'll be good. And uh, we can then just, or oh, is it Joshua? It's Joshua. Um, so whenever you're ready, Joshua, I'll wait. No pressure. One minute's coming to me. I've headed this up as the promise, which is realised through faith. The promise, and we'll find out what that promise is. It's quite an amazing promise that God gave to Abraham. We'll read it here nice and clearly. All right, okay, we might, while we're still struggling with that, I might just read on. Uh, I wanted to read out of one translation, which is the ESV that I've got, because it is a, this is a difficult passage to get your brain around, uh, and it's made more difficult by having multiple translations. Um, nevertheless, I'll read if you want to listen carefully. Uh, For the promise to Abraham and his offspring that he would be heir of the world. There we go. He would be heir of the world did not come through the law, but through the righteousness of faith. For if it is the adherents of the law who are the heirs, faith is null and the promise is void. For the law brings wrath, but where there is no law, there is no transgression. In verse 13 there, Abraham is promised a very special promise that he would be heir of the world. And yet we yet nowhere in the Old Testament do we find, especially particularly in those chapters in Genesis, do we find that particular promise made to Abraham. Yet here Paul is saying that this was a promise. What we need to understand is that Paul is now writing, he's writing under the inspiration of the Holy Spirit. He could very well be summarising what was said in those chapters of all the promises that God made to Abraham about how he's going to give him the land of Canaan. He was going to give him, he's going to give him descendants like the stars in the sky. He was going to bless him and anybody who didn't bless him or curse him, God would curse them. And yet those who would bless him were, um, would be also blessed. Uh, God was uh, Abraham's very great reward. And yet uh, here we see in the New Testament that no doubt this is what happened. God had promised Abraham to be heir of the world. What an amazing promise. And the, that promise, verse 14 says, was not based on adhering or a, a co complying with God's commands. It was by faith, it says in verse 14. For, because it says that uh, quite quite clearly. And if, and if we found out that... Uh, it could be by the law that that the, God's promises could be realised through the law. Well, the very first time we sin, bingo, we, the promise could not be fulfilled. No, the promise is fulfilled to those who have faith. In Abraham's case, he certainly had faith, as we will see. You know, if there, the, if there's also a, a passage there which says in verse... Uh, in verse... 15, it says, for the law brings wrath, but where there is no law, there is no transgression. You know, if there were no road rules in New South Wales, uh, the policeman could never pull you up and say, oh, he could pull you up, but he could not have you charged and certainly couldn't have you found guilty of breaking the, the speed limit. But, um, but I've got to tell you, there are such road rules and where the road rule says, if you go beyond a certain speed in that particular location where there is a speed sign, if you break that, you can be charged and you will be found guilty. That's the purpose of the law of God, to show what really was the case, that we are sinners. And, and the law of God demonstrated us. Just take the Ten Commandments. You shall love the Lord your God with all your heart. Who can say that? None of us. We desire it. But can we say every day of our life we have loved the Lord with all of our, with all of our heart? It says here, in the same way, God's law simply makes us guilty when we disobey his laws. 
And, the, and when we read the book of James chapter 2 and verse 10, it makes it very clear that if we breach God's law in one respect, just break one single in your whole life, I don't think that's ever possible, but if, if it was, if, you, if we disobeyed one of God's laws, we are guilty of breaking a whole lot. It's like cracking an egg, isn't it? You can't just crack an egg a little bit and uh, somehow preserve the integrity of the egg. No, once you crack it, it's cracked. And, and uh, there's nothing wrong with the law of God. It's good. But it can never save. It just brings wrath. It can never fulfill God's promises that he made to Abraham. It can, and it can never fulfill God's promises that he made to the Jewish nation. And he cannot. And, and uh, keeping the law can never fulfill God's promises to us. We are all found guilty and under God's wrath. Let's go to verse 16. The next slide. And it says this. That is why... It depends on faith in order that the promise may rest on grace and be guaranteed to all his offspring, not only to the adherent of the law, but also to the one who shares the faith of Abraham, who is the father of us all. Verse 17, as it is written, I have made you father of many nations in the presence of the God in whom he believed, who gives life to the dead and calls into existence the things that do not exist. Now, I know your translations may have it slightly different. Uh, I think it says something along the lines of calls things um, that are as, as if they are not. Uh, something like that. Anyway, it's just a translation. I'm following the ESV. Verse 18, in hope, he believed against hope that he should become the father of many nations as he had been told, so shall your offspring be. In that verse 16, the fulfilment of, of the promise to Abraham, which verse 13 said was that he would be the heir of the world. Well, it doesn't rest on Abraham's obedience. I've said that a number of times now. It rests, as it says here, on two things. It rests on God's grace. What Abraham didn't deserve, he got it. He got this wonderful promise. So, so it's God's sovereign grace that uh, that promise rested on. But the second thing is quite clear from this verse. It rested also on Abraham's faith. Abraham's faith. On those two bases, the word says here, God's promise to Abraham to make him heir of the world is guaranteed. That's guaranteed. It's not something that may be. It was guaranteed. And uh, then that last part of that verse 16 that goes on, and please don't miss it, it's really important for us. It says this, but God's promise to Abraham, which again was to the heir of the world, is extended to all, to all of us. And the condition was to the one who shares the faith of Abraham. When we have the same faith as Abraham, we have this wonderful promise here in Scripture. It's an amazing thing. And it says, uh, of course, that Jesus is the only one who, um, how can we say it, uh, deserves to be called the heir of the world. He's actually referred to as the heir of all things in Hebrews chapter 1, in the second verse of that, of that whole book of Hebrews. He is the heir of all things. And yet, as other verses in the scripture says, the believer also will be heir of all things in Christ, with Christ. In Galatians chapter 3, verse 29, it says this, and if you are Christ, in other words, if you are a believer, if you are a saved person, if you've been born again by, by the Spirit of God through your faith in Christ. This is what applies. It says, for if you are Christ, then you are Abraham's offspring, heirs according to the promise. In 1 Corinthians chapter 3, verses 21 and a few verses after that, it says this. Paul is writing again. He's writing to a church, by the way, who weren't particularly holy. He's writing to a church who weren't particularly God-focused. They had lots of problems. There was lots of drama going inside that church. Quite dysfunctional. And yet, what does he say to these believers? These believers, he says in 1 Corinthians 3.21, he says, For all things are yours, whether Paul or Apollos or Cephas, that's Peter, or the world, he says, or life or death or the present or the future, all are yours, and you are Christ, and Christ, and Christ is God's. John Piper 
well-known Bible teacher in the United States, he makes this comment. He says, by us being made to be heirs of the world with Christ, he says, Christ doesn't lose out here. He says this, Christ loses nothing, but we gain everything. We gain everything. How wonderful is our God? Can we say we deserve this? No, we can't. And yet it's been freely given to us. How wonderful the promise is. And it certainly uh, gives me, I don't know about you, a new insight into that well-known passage in 1 Corinthians chapter 2 where it says, I hath not seen, nor ear heard, nor has it entered into the heart of man those things that God has prepared for those or them that love him. It, it really starts to expand that verse that comes to our lips fairly easily. God has is so gracious to us, it's beyond understanding. Paul then goes on to say that Abraham is therefore our father. He's not saying he is our physical father, that's not the case, but he's saying he's our spiritual father of faith. Down in verse 17, God promised Abraham that he would be the father of many nations. He promised him that in Genesis 17. And he's I think that's probably most likely referring to Abraham having many descendants. Yet at that time, he had, he had uh, uh, no descendants, possibly Ishmael. I'd have to check the sequence again. But in, in Genesis 17, also he refers to Sarah as being the mother of, of nations. Abraham being the father of many nations and Sarah being the mother of nations. And Abraham knew, of course, that God was the one who gives life to the dead and calls into existence things that do not exist or he calls things uh, that are as if they are not. Abraham knew that God's power was and still is total. It is total power. Abraham knew that. And God has the power to fulfill all his promises. Abraham knew nothing was impossible with God. You know, we often pray, don't we? We, we pray... Uh, Lord, if it be your will, and we, we and that's, that is quite fine. But where God makes a promise, I think it is totally inappropriate for us to somehow pray, Lord, please help us to, uh, you know, if it's your will for such and such to happen. If God has already said it, our responsibility is put our trust in it. Where it's not stated in Scripture as a promise, we ask God in humility. We ask him, if it be your will, please give us clarity what we should do here. But where the promise has been made, we are expected like Abraham to have faith in what God has said. Um, it says in verse 18, this man Abraham, he's a remarkable character, his faith. It says he believed, sorry, in hope he, belie he believed against hope. His, his hope was not wishful thinking. It was a, a certainty in his mind. He was certain that, that he would indeed become the father of many nations. Why? Because God had promised it. And we've heard that expression before, haven't we? God promised it, I believe it, that settles it. Well, we could probably say in the case of Abraham, God promised it, Abraham believed it, that settled it as far as Abraham was concerned. Verse 19, bring the next slide up if we can. Uh, he did not weaken in his faith when he, was, when he considered his own body, which was as good as dead, since he was about 100 years old, or when he considered the barrenness of Sarah's womb. No unbelief made him waver concerning the promise of God, but he grew strong in his faith and he gave glory to God. Verse 21, fully convinced that God was able to do what he had promised. That is why his faith was counted to him as righteousness. But the words, this is verse 23, but the words it was counted to him were not written for his sake alone, but, but for ours also. It will be counted to us who believe in him who raised from the dead Jesus our Lord, who was delivered up for our trespasses and raised for our justification. Abraham's situation was, humanly speaking, hopeless. Hopeless. Sarah was barren. She had no children from her womb. She was well past her childbearing. And by the time we get to the fulfilment of this, of well, not to the fulfilment, to the time when God makes this uh, some wonderful promises. Sarah is, as I understand, 89 years old. It was fulfilled when she was 90. At 89 years, she's going to be promised something. 
And Abraham's body, it says, was as good as dead. And he's 99 years old, one year away from getting the letter from the queen. Uh, so Abraham's only child at that stage was Ishmael. And uh, that was not from Sarah. That was from Sarah's handmaiden, servant, female servant, Hagar. And that was, God made it clear that this Ishmael was not the one to be the promised line from which many nations would come. God's covenant was not going to be with this man, Ishmael. It was going to be from, as we find in Genesis 17, verses 15 onwards, from Abraham and Sarah's future child. They had no children together. And God names that child 12 months in advance. Names him as Isaac. And God makes a promise to make an everlasting covenant with Isaac and his descendants, not with Ishmael. So here we have this, the promise has been made, but there is a medical impossibility here. These two people are just, they just cannot produce a child in the normal way. But God has made a promise. And Abraham's faith in God's promise remained rock solid. We read that here, rock solid. He didn't waver in unbelief. And you know, when we face difficulties that appear to be hopeless, whether it's at work, in the family, even in the church, in our relationships together. Remember Abraham. More importantly, remember the God of Abraham, who is our God too. This morning, um, last night and this morning, we had our one of our sons and his family staying with us. And uh, my grandson, Anthony, that's uh, my son's Philip, my son Philip's son. Just before I was about to leave, I called Anthony to me. I said, Anthony, and I was, I said to him, you know, Grandpa, that's me. I said, he's feeling a bit nervous this morning because he's got to go and preach in church. He's feeling a bit nervous. I said, will you pray for me, Anthony? Do you remember that verse in the Bible? Be strong and courageous. I said, do you know that verse? He says, yep, I do. I said, would you pray for me? So he did. And he prayed and he said, dear Lord Jesus, Will you help my grandpa to be strong and courageous as he goes to church to preach to the people? You know, it sounds, it's beautiful. There's a little boy, he's only, what, eight? And he prayed that prayer, and I stood there while he prayed for me. And uh, it's a wonderful thing. It's a wonderful thing that we take exactly those words upon ourselves in it, whatever our situation is, be strong and courageous, not because we're wonderful, but because our God has made promises. He will never leave us or forsake us. That's a promise. And, um, and we can confidently say, as the book of Hebrews says, the Lord is my helper, no matter what. What I will not fear. Okay, verses 20 to 21. What was Abraham's response to God's promise? It says he grew strong in the faith. And then it says... He was fully convinced that God was able to do what he had promised. Abraham's faith is described here. It says he is a person who is fully convinced that what God is able to do, he, 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 he carries out. This, I think, is probably the best definition of faith that I can see. Faith, I would just paraphrase in single words, which the Bible does in various translations. Some refer to as faith. If you go to the Gospel of John, the word John uses is believe. You read Paul, he, he uses believe, but he also uses faith. Some translations use words like trust. Some of the great evangelists we find faith is trust. Trust in God, trust in Christ. Others refer to, refer to by various other words. But here we see this man is fully convinced. What a great definition that God is able to keep his promises. How can I become a person of faith? How can I live my life out like Abraham? How can I have my faith grow? Do some just naturally more have more faith? You know, Joe's much person has much more trust in God than what I do. Is that just a natural thing that just happens to some people? And for me, well, I'm just a bit weak. 
Well, the thing about Abraham, they've got to look at what happened to in his life. He was fully convinced. How can we be fully convinced? Well, it's the same way as Abraham. What was happened to Abraham? He was exposed to the very words of God. He was exposed to God speaking to him. He was exposed to God's word. And, he, and as he did, he became more aware of the wonderful character of God. Our wonderful God desires to bless us, protect us and provide for us. And the scripture tells us quite clearly, faith comes by hearing and hearing by the word of God or by the word of Christ, it says in my translation. If the Bible is something that we only open up once a week as we follow along while the speaker like me is speaking, don't expect to have strong faith. In fact, you won't have strong faith. If you were to have strong faith, I think that would be unbiblical. Of course, the word of God says, faith comes by hearing and hearing by the word of Christ or by the word of God. Your faith and mine will always stay weak if we do not spend time reading the word of God, becoming aware of the character of our wonderful God in whom we can put our trust. If he's somebody who's removed, and we think, oh, if only I felt closer to God. Well, let me ask you the question. When was the last time? When was the last, I ask myself the same question too. When was the last time we opened God's word? You know, it's, it's often been said, will we feed a baby only once a week? If Debbie and Sandy only fed um, Samuel every Sunday, he would get very sick. We need to be fed daily, and I'm sure they, I know they feed him more than once a day, and just like we do. Scripture is our spiritual food, and without it, we will not grow, faith, grow strong in the faith. And verse 22 to 25, it says, When Abraham believed God's promise, uh, he trusted in God's word, and his faith was counted to him as righteousness. Counted means credited. Some other verses will say reckoned or imputed. I like the word credited because I had a, an accounting uh, training. Through his faith, his faith, Abraham was credited with a right standing with God. Verses 23 and 24, it says that this counting or, credited, or crediting of righteousness was not just for Abraham, it applies to us as well. The same rule. People often ask, uh, and I know of a story where a man asked a speaker, and I think Harry Ironside is a brethren guy, um, um, the question was asked by the speaker to the audience, uh, how was people in the Old Testament um, declared right with God? How were they saved? And somebody said, by, keep, by sacrificing lambs. And then somebody else said uh, they were saved by keeping the law. And then anyway, the story goes, I think of Harry Einstein, I think it was, he says, well, my Bible tells me that in the Old Testament, people were saved exactly the same way as people are saved today, and that's by faith, by faith. But faith must have an object, mustn't it? Trust must have an object. Belief must have an object. Abraham's faith was in what God would do in the future. Today, as we look back, we trust in what God has done in the past. And uh, the Bible in this, these verses here makes it very clear that we must believe that God delivered up Jesus to the cross for our trespasses. We must believe that. We must trust as that is the truth, that God delivered up Jesus to go to the cross and there to die for our trespasses, for our sins. And secondly, that God... This is the second thing, important thing that we must have as an object. We must have faith in that God raised Jesus from the dead for our justification to declare us right in God's sight. They are the two things. You can't have one without the other. You can't say, as I know, of, uh, I can tell you a, a story, but I won't, of a man who believed that Jesus died for his sins but he was unconvinced about the resurrection of Jesus. Such a person on the basis of this here, that such a person is lost. 
We must believe in the Lord Jesus as our Saviour, as our sin bearer. We must believe he is risen as well. The scripture, you read through the book of Acts, it's very clear. That was the message. Strongly in every gospel message was the risen Lord, Lord Jesus. Justification, as I said, is a legal term. It means that God the judge declares the sinner as now being righteous or right before him. And so the phrase, raised for our justification, which I actually found quite difficult to get my brain around, maybe you have too. Raised for our justification means that when God raised Jesus, he showed that he accepted the sacrifice of Jesus as totally sufficient for the, for the to pay the penalty for our sins. Without the resurrection, there would be no, if you like, approval from God. That's why the resurrection of Jesus is so important. God raised Jesus from the dead. It's a, it's, it underpins our faith, and our faith must be in the resurrection of Jesus as well.